How you doing, folks? Um, you're very welcome. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you can hit that subscribe button and <laughs> that bell as they all say. Um, look, this is a fantastic opportunity for me and I suppose for you or for whoever to speak to Ron Harmond. Ron Harmond is the man behind Big Equipment Company, um, which is part of Big Bud. Ron was he was there at the very beginning. Um, absolutely fantastic guy. A bit of a story. I actually done this exact interview about two weeks ago, and my computer crashed. It just went. And I had an interview with Machinery Pete, and I had an interview with Ron Harmond. And I did an interview with Sherry from Heritage Iron Magazine, which are all there up on the YouTube channel, so you can go in and see all of them as well. But the computer crashed and the all went. So I went begging back to Ron Harmond and Machinery Pete and Sherry, can we do this again, guys? I'm very, very sorry and whatnot. No problem. Brilliant. I just couldn't praise them um, enough. And I was like, they just they were just willing to give me their time and I I I'm mean, nobody really at this like you know, but they just willing to give me their time, willing to help me maybe get off the ground and willing to help me maybe get something going. And um brilliant guys, I can't thank you enough. The, the whole lot of you and even for yourself for watching, look, you don't have to listen to me rambling on. Here's Ron Harmond and what he had to say about um big board and I suppose big equipment and big American trike. Um, Ron. Okay. Ron, how are you doing? Doing good. Great. We're doing doing well. Our weather's improved. Instead of uh, 25, 30 below, we're about 30, 40 above. So that's a nice change for us over here in Montana. That's a major. Like 35, 40 below before we start talking about tractors. Like it, it must freeze up everything. It does, yeah. You kind of get used to it, but you don't really get used to it either. But yeah, you got to watch everything, and and uh, it, a lot of things can go wrong when it gets that cold because it just uh, freezes up uh, everything. Vehicles and everything don't work very well in that weather either. So yeah, they don't yeah. know because um, I, I know we had a big freeze. A big, uh, I suppose a big freeze here going back about 10 years ago and people are still talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I hear you. Ron, oh, I good. Suppose, yeah, Ron, I suppose for people, I feel I've been following you and I've been watching your, your company. You, you, are, you are big equipment. And um, I suppose you were probably there at the very, very start of, of Big Bud. And of course, everyone in the world knows know the big board tractors and if you google big tractors it's big board is the first tractor that's going to come up like i suppose yeah. we know we know america has some massive massive farms and massive ranches but like yeah, i suppose to us here in ireland we still can't comprehend the, the size of the equipment and the size of the, the machines that that you're you're making and refurbishing now over where you are Yes, you know, uh, you know, Big Bud really came out of uh, the, uh, of a two men that, two men sold, that wagon. sold Wagner tractors in the area next to my dad's truck stop, and so I've watched that since since the very uh, very early '60s, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and when Wagner sold their production to John Deere in New Year's Eve of 68, 69, uh, Bud Nelson, where the name of the tractor came from, and Wilbur Hensler started to, to manufacture their own tractor. Uh, and they wanted to do some different things that had been done before. And that was to try to build a tractor that was infinitely rebuildable. And the way they did, wanted to do that was to make a fold-up cab on all of the tractors that made it so the cab would fold up and out of the way. And everything was built on a skid system or like you would see on a generator set. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you could slide out those components and put different components on a new skid system and slide it back in the tractor again. And that makes the tractor really updatable. And... Uh, 
So they did that earlier on. And, uh, and uh, so that New Year's Eve of 68, 69, they're no longer a Wagner dealer. Uh, so they built one tractor in 69. And by the time they got to 1974, they had built about 20 tractors. And uh, that's where I came on board in, in uh, mid to late 74. And by 75 was my first full year uh, owning a company called Northern Manufacturing. And Northern Manufacturing continued on from 75 through 77. And then I changed the name of the company to fit more of our product line called Big Bud Tractors Incorporated, because really that's all we were doing is manufacturing tractors. And that continued on um, to uh, an interesting situation where uh, I was getting, I had actually de delivered a few tractors to Australia by then, delivered some tractors to uh, the Middle East actually, and and of course, a lot to Canada. And um, so we're reaching out a little bit. But the one thing that that was apparent to us on horsepower was is in 76, I went to the Tulare Farm Show in Bakersfield, California area. And uh, I took a tractor there that was a uh, originally a 350 horse tractor. And the next year I took in a 525 horsepower tractor and a couple guys I met there was, was called the Rossi brothers in Bakersfield and they were 10,000 acre cotton farmers and uh, they bought uh, every time I'd bring a new bigger tractor there they would buy it and uh, so they talked to me one day about a wanting to deep rip uh, anywhere from 38 to 42 inches deep they wanted to deep rip their their ground because it compacts so it was a type of ground that would compact with irrigation. And so they took a piece of ground and they tested out and found that they could increase their yield by a nice percentage if they could rip it every year. But they had three D9 caterpillars with five shanks each and they were going about a half a mile an hour. They wanted to know if I could build them a tractor that would take the place of those and allow them to, instead of just doing a third of their acres every year, actually deep rip the whole 10,000 acres. So we did a lot of testing and, and figured out that uh, the, uh, did a lot of testing and we figured out that they, um, it would take, around that 800 to 1,000 horsepower is gonna be in that range. So that's when we, in 77, we built the 747 Big Bud. We made it so we could go up to around 1,000 horsepower. We started off at 760, just there, just a day, a few days, and we increased it to 860, kind of a test bed, and then we got it to 960. And we were able to pull 15 shank subsoiler, but we were able to pull it into that five to six mile an hour range. Yeah. And they were actually able to get all 10,000 acres deep ripped. It certainly did what they wanted. And uh, uh, we didn't build it for show and go. We really built it to solve a particular need on a farm. And uh, it worked out real well. Uh, we had a lot of challenges. Uh, we went to the mining construction industry to determine the best components out there for that horsepower range and determine what we wanted to use. A 16 V92 Detroit engine uh, used a twin disc 2610 series transmission, uh, 85,000 pound Clark axles, all of which were used in mining construction and put that into this farm tractor. And our big challenge was tires. Uh, there was no tires built to go on to such a rig. And we found a big construction tire used on the largest scrapers at the time and some big mining trucks, 37 and a half inches wide on a 35 inch rim, but the tires were approximately eight feet tall. So we took those tires and had egg lugs put on them, which is another story and uh, put those underneath the tractor. And they've just recently been taken off. We're someplace in the 13 to 14,000 hours that we've got on that tractor. And uh, the tires actually have some 
decent rubber left on them, but the but the uh, but the beads on the tires are starting to break down, and so uh, Titan Tire Company come up with new 1400 series tires for that tractor, which was been on the internet and so on. And anyway, we just upgraded those original tires. So, so we were uh, pretty proud of it. That tractor did that 10,000 acres for Rossi's as long as they owned the farm until they passed away. Then it was bought by a guy in Florida on a big 40,000 acre ranch. He wanted to deep rip the whole ranch and take off all the trees and turn it into a large vegetable farm, which he did. And that 747 cleared all that ground and deep ripped it all. A lot of it was peat ground, so he got the ground, as he called it, percolating, where the where the uh, moisture could wick up through the peat, and he didn't have to do as much irrigation. Yeah. And then on his 20th anniversary, we bought the 747 back and brought it to oh, okay. uh, Haber, Montana, and sold it to the Williams brothers, which, uh, if you go online and look, they're the primary owners. And their goal was, is they pulled 80 feet of grain drills uh, behind 80 foot of chisel plow. So instead of having to pre-work their ground, they could go in and, and uh, do it in one pass, uh, actually work the ground and seed the ground at the same time. And then uh, they went to air drills thereafter. There wasn't at that time that big of an air drill. They went to some smaller big buds and the 747, in a lot of ways, got retired. Uh, and then the last 10 years, approximately, it's it's been more on tour than it has been in the field. Although it's back out at Williams Brothers, and there was some recent film done, I think, going back and pulling that same 80-foot chisel plow of recent. So that's a little history on that. And we continued to build 650 horsepower tractors some 750s. Uh, we built a, another custom built tractor with a 3508 CAD engine in it, which is what they use in the D10, D11. And we turned it up to uh, 950 horsepower, capable of 11 or 1200. Meanwhile, we put the largest injectors made into the uh, 747. And, you know, it's upwards of that. Uh, 12, 1300 horsepower itself these days. So, uh, but there was a reason why we built those tractors. The guy in Texas, we built the, with the 3508 CAD engine in it. Uh, he had a similar need. He was using several tractors to till his ground and he wanted to get it down to one tractor. Uh, help is always an issue on farms and, uh, so Dan Patterson down in uh, Texas uh, bought this. We had a special plow made with, with uh, uh, a number of shanks on it. I, I'm trying to remember exactly, but I think it it's, doesn't go nearly as deep as the one that Rossi's had. I think he goes a foot and a half deep or so, but I believe it's got 30 shanks on it. And we're able to pull that at uh, a good clip and uh, uh, and uh, it it does the job for him as well. Pre works all of his ground, so his seeding equipment can come in behind it. And uh, and of course, if you can hit the ground with that type of implement, and you can go fast enough, it really pulverizes. You don't have to work and work to get the ground chewed up. It just explodes the ground largely and and really works it up nicely so that you have a nice seed bed to, to go back into. So those are a couple examples of tractors uh, uh, that we've done. And of course, these days we're still doing what we've always done in a way, but we're not producing tractors since 1991. We, it was our last production run where we had a, a number of one model of tractor going down the assembly line. Since then, we have reworked uh, many tractors, but we've upgraded a lot of tractors as well. And so I changed the name to Big Equipment Company because we do other things than just do uh, big buds, but that's still our primary business. And uh, we have a lot of work in front of us. Uh, the, new ele the, the electronics have come into a lot of the new tractors. A lot of farmers aren't real happy with that. 
they have a lot of issues with electronics. Uh, the reason why they like Big Buds, I think, uh, is they're built heavy duty, they're rebuildable, and they use standard off the shelf parts, but we use a very uh, few electronic components so that uh, they're very dependable then, and you can get almost anybody to fix and repair them. So we've actually had a resurgence in the last 10 years for us to redo these tractors and put different engines in and, and uh, different components in the tractors. And we're quite busy doing that these days versus let's say building a tractor from scratch. We're not, we're not doing that as much, but there's another reason for that. I don't know if you have this in Ireland or not in some of the other countries, but the, we had a very large farmer in California buy a number of our tractors and they, California was preventing us from delivering them or they tried to. And he took it to the Supreme Court there in California and found that because of the serial number on the frame, we were grandfathered in to not have to go to tier four final engines. So we didn't have to do the deaf thing. We didn't have to do a lot of electronics. And that has quite, caused quite a resurgence of people knowing that they don't have to go to this full electronics. And what's interesting about it is the new tractors have two fuel lines that run from the fuel system. The one runs over to the regeneration side of the engine and the other one runs directly to the fuel pump. And so they're not fuel efficient at all. We can take a engine that is half again more horsepower and we have comparable fuel consumption. And so uh, the idea that somehow they're more fuel efficient or whatever they are not, uh, they might clean up the exhaust more. But what our theory is, if you put a large enough engine in and you're not pushing that engine to its maximum, yeah. we actually uh, are putting less smoke out than some of the other tractors. So we think uh, there's a different way to be efficient without being forced to go to death fluid and all of that. So that's kind of what we're about these days is, uh, is taking older tractors. I, uh, one thing that people wonder about with our design of our tractors is maybe why they're maybe as heavy duty as they are. We, we have found in the industry, it doesn't matter in the world where you have a tractor, what's going on, it takes roughly 100 pounds per horsepower to get the power to the ground. We either have all the same basic track technology or tire technology. And so what we found is why not build the basic dry weight into the tractor, the minimum needed, not the maximum, the minimum dry weight needed when you're building the tractor. You don't have to put suitcase weights on or hang weights front and rear. So we, uh, most of our tractors, if our, if our 747 weighs dry, right around that 100,000 pounds. Well, there's a thousand horsepower capability there. Mm -hmm. If you buy a 525 Big Bud, it weighs a little over 50,000 pounds dry. And the way that you do that is you build a fully self-supporting frame that isn't dependent upon any of the components. Because we all know tractors that are kind of known to have transmission problems or engine problems. And you, the whole track makes the whole tractor bad because it's not really very updatable. You really need to either figure out a better transmission, but you may not be able to install it. So in our case, uh, we, we don't weld any mounts into our frame at all. Everything is bolted in so that if you change engines or transmissions, you don't have to redesign our frame at all. We use all standard mounting. So we can go from Cat to Cummings to a man diesel engine out of Germany. And we don't have to redesign the frame or the mount system at all. The other thing that's unique in the world is every rear engine mount, given the fact there's series of mounts, like a, like a double lot bell housing or a number one, number two, number three. I'm not saying there aren't different sizes, but the fact that all of those mounts are the same in the world means that the only thing you got to deal with if you have a 50 inch wide frame rail is the length of the engine. And we put that on a slider system so you can slide the front engine mount and its radiator back and forth for the different lengths. And then that allows you to install any engine in the tractor that's presently made, Ooh. including any of the new engines. We did the same with the transmission mounts. 
which is a little more technical to talk about, but uh, the, the drop from the center line of the input of the top of the transmission to the center line of the bottom is, is somewhat changeable. So you've got to watch with that, but otherwise, whether it be a twin disc transmission, an Allison transmission, a Fuji Teco transmission built in whatever, they all fit in this tractor because we can raise and lower the height of the engine to coincide with the difference of the input and output shaft on the transmission, allowing any engine or most, not all, most transmissions will fit in our tractor as well. So that really means that as long as you don't break the frame on the tractor, and since we use one inch, inch and a half and two inch frames, I haven't ever had one break yet, maybe they will someday, but the idea is that it makes the tractor infinitely rebuildable and infinitely upgradable. So that's really the main business we're in these days. Yeah, so it's like, I was, we would say with Big Bud, were you one of the first people to make the frame, make it, make it in that design that you could remove the engine? But that, to me, that's fantastic, as you know it, and everyone else knows it, a lot of these modern tractors, these modern built, these we'll say the big name tractors, the frame, we'll say the engine and the gearbox and all the axles, they're part of the frame. So they, when they're burnt out, they're burnt out. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And, 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 and the problem is, you know, a lot of the engineering done on new tractors, and we're not knocking anyone out there. There's a lot of other good tractors that do a good job for a lot of people. So, uh, that's great. The problem is, is that when you design a tr anything, if you wait about 10 years, you can look back and say, that was a really good tractor. We don't really have engine problems, transmission problems, and so on. But the testing programs of the major companies all go into that 1,000 to 3,000 hour range on total testing. Mm -hmm. We think it needs to be around that 10,000 hours. We have many, many tractors now getting into the 20 and 30,000 hour range. We actually have some out there that I can't document because they're owned by Del Monte in South Africa. And those tractors I sold in the Middle East aren't accessible because they're in Iran. But for instance, we know we have 30, 40,000 hours on them. So if you put the same engine in or rebuild that same engine or buy a different engine, they, you can just keep rebuilding them and the frames really don't wear out. And so it's just the components. And so that makes it, that's what we called it in, in many ways, an infinitely rebuildable tractor. What the majors have done is they take the integral strength of the engine block, the integral strength of the transmission case, the integral strength of the axle system. And then they build a much lighter frame system around that that has all the welded in components and mounts. And so if you as an end user find that, whoops, I wish I had a different engine, I wish I had a different transmission, it really means you've gotta, you've gotta compromise and continue to fix or repair those items or those tractors become worth less money, you park them on the fence line at some point. In our case, uh, I think we did a fair job of picking out the components. But when you, when you do it that way, it's very difficult to cut up the frame and cut the mounts out and try to put a different transmission, and most people just won't do it. And then it's not only that, I think uh, I was a Case IH dealer for a period of time, and I remember bringing in some of their uh, units, and I found that they would give me like 30 and 40 hours just to get the cab off and just to get at the component yeah. so that you could actually remove the component. And in our case, we can actually in the field, uh, fold up the cab hydraulically, fold up the hood hydraulically. We can remove an engine transmission, any major component in the field with, yes, it takes a crane or a forklift or something, but that's much cheaper than uh, disassembling the tractor after you get it into your shop in town and it may take a much, much longer to get it repaired and back to you. So the speed of the repair, the cost of the repair, and I'll give you another quick example. For instance, Fuji Teco was used in Case IH in their 9,000 series tractors. 
uh, and now they're using it in their newer tractors at 16 speed. But the original Fuji Teco transmission costs about 19,000 US dollars today to buy a new factory rebuilt. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> what we found is, is that uh, <clears throat> if you go to their new tractors where they made them elect all tied into their computer systems and all electronic, they've over doubled the price there between 40 and 50,000 for largely the same transmission <clears throat> with very little more torque capacity and uh, just because they've got it computer controlled, <clears throat> you don't have a choice of using a different transmission because the computer won't talk to that new transmission. The tractor won't run or start or whatever. And we think that's the crossover that's unacceptable. So good engineering may not always be best for the end user. Mm -hmm. uh, the end user is the one that suffers uh, because they're held to have to do business with them. They have to do the service. Where in our case, if we deliver a big button down to Arkansas or Florida or California, any general mechanic can fix it or work on it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, you were saying there where to go, you were going on about the, the emissions. So we call it here, we have a tier six and there's tier four. And I think we're going to lead into tier seven now. But what a lot of our farmers are, we're not dealing in the horsepower that you're dealing with. But we'll say going back 10 years ago, there was a lot of tractors and they all had big six cylinder engines and they were kind of ticking over very low revs and they were putting out, we say, 130, 140, 150 horsepower. Now they're gone to, to four cylinder engines. They have a turbo, they have everything, but the engine is at its very maximum capability. And mm -hmm. I, I think myself, in a very, very short space of time, the engines are going to be burnt out way faster than what the, the big six-cylinder engine is going to be. So uh, mm -hmm. I reckon there's going to be yards and yards of, of the, we call them the majors, the yards and yards of tractors parked in dealerships, and no one will be able to fix them. There'll be no, like you said, even about the replacement parts and even working up the hours. By the time they figure out that it was a good engine. That engine is discontinued for about four years. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and we're seeing that over here too. And, and, uh, the, but the, you know, and, and insult to injury really, mm -hmm. uh, what we're seeing is, is tractors that are not all computered up and that most general mechanics can repair, the values are starting to go back up. Now, it's easy to pick out a good one from an old one or from a bad one, like we've said. Mm -hmm. You can look back 10 years and you can look at ones that don't have really any major component problems. Yes, they all wear out, but they don't have any major component problems. Or they have a known problem that's repairable. Mm -hmm. uh, and those tractors are going up in value. Every year they get to be worth more, not because they have an antique value, yeah. but they're going up because they have a repairable value. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they, have a, they have a known ingredient called, uh, you know, the old uh, thing of looking at tractors with many hours and knowing if they really have issues or not. So what's happening on the big bud, if we've got a, uh, uh, a tractor that's, well taken care of. It might be a 500 horsepower tractor. It might be a 400. It might be a 300. But almost all of our tractors are selling well above their original retail value, uh, just as a used tractor. And then we have people, let's just take a, a 500 horsepower tractor in industry. And there's really three majors. There's deer. And, and I'm not talking about majors. And I'm not beating them up because they, uh, they make good tractors. We just don't like what they've done to them in terms of service and repair and, and, and maintenance. But uh, you take those three product lines. And uh, let's just say a 500 horsepower tractor, for conversation's sake, <clears throat> if it has all the bells and whistles, can be up to a half a million dollar tractor. Yeah. If we are taking a older 525 big bud tractor that sold originally for $150,000, we're putting another 100,000 in it, so we're up to 250. And we can take one of those tractors and put it out there 
and completely put new air conditioning, all new rebuilt engine transmission, every wire, every fitting, every hose is all new, all new interior, new seat. So yes, it's still a, might be a 1980 tractor, but it's, it's totally rebuilt. We can almost guarantee because of historically that you can run that 10 to 15,000 hours and then you can rebuild just some of the components. You don't have to do this 100,000 thing. You can maybe spend uh, a quarter to half of that and run another 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. And so we think that's a more efficient way to go for a lot of people. And so our frames that have a serial number on them, which dates the tractor back to a pre-91, Mm -hmm. uh, is, is a valuable thing to us because mm -hmm. it, it's, it's rebuildable. It isn't just looked at as another old used tractor. It's an infinitely rebuildable. So I'll have somebody come in to me and say, I want a brand new engine or I want a rebuilt engine or I want a new transmission or a rebuilt transmission. We don't really care. Mm -hmm. They all fit uh, given a horsepower range and so away you go. So we just, that's our business and we specialize in that. And uh, we're very, very busy. We had a fire here in the end of 17 and burn up our whole facility. Uh, we've built back uh, some of what we're renting other buildings. We're still operating, but we did get hurt in that process. But the beauty of it is, is that we have every component in the tractor has other vendors than us. So unless, uh, <clears throat> there's nothing that we couldn't go buy or get or rebuild. And here's the other big thing. You go back 10 years now on a new tractor. So you go back from a tractor that was a uh, 2020 and you go back pre 2010. There are already many components in some of these tractors where they made components for themselves. Like if you go to a, Case IH, you go to an Aveco engine. Well, who's that? That's Fiat. That's great. Fiat's a good company. But at the end of the day, there's already some parts that are not as readily available. You go back 20 years ago, there's many tractors that have parts that are available. You go back 30 years and 40 years, almost a guarantee there's most many things you cannot buy. Yeah. What's interesting about the oldest big bud is it was a Cummings engine, it was a fuller transmission, it was a standard shift, it was either cat axles or Clark axles. All the parts are still available because they were used in hundreds of, of uh, companies and products worldwide. So there's enough product out there. If you look at the four wheel drive industry, I like to use some of these numbers to put it into perspective. So a night and uh, let's go all the way back Let's go back to uh, 1990. In 1990, after the big turndown in, in the 80s, big blow up, high interest rates and so on, there was about 20 different manufacturers. And we essentially went down to, to, uh, to three, the three that exist now. And there was 10,000 four wheel drives sold in Canada and the US, we call it the North American market. By 19, that was 1990. By year 2000, that went down to, um, uh, I gotta make sure you get my numbers right here, but that went all the way down to a little over 2000 tractors. Mm -hmm. Versatile alone made 3,500 3, tractors in 1980. Versatile could have doubled, could have built the whole, the whole sales uh, that were made back in those days. So at the end of the day, um, uh, then let's jump ahead another 10 years. So let's go to 2010. By 2010, the market brought, jumped back to between 3,500 and 4,000, depending on how you want to count that. So it doubled from 90, so that's good news, but it's only 40% of what it was in 1990. So by year 2000, uh, you know, it, it, it was back up to, I'm going to call it 4,000 tractors. Mm -hmm. So what's happened is tractors have to last longer. People aren't trading as often. Uh, so the pressure is really on to get some longevity out of it. But when they're taking tractors that they built parts for, 
They don't want to build parts forever for the old tractors. And to be honest with you, I think that they, they there's some design built into that to where they want you to actually come back and buy another new tractor. They don't really want you to keep it for your lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's, you know, some things going on there. But so we just take a different approach to longevity, uh, take a different approach to parts availability. Uh, we actually help farmers when we sold tractors in Australia. We There's still tractors running over there. We very, very seldom ever send a part over there. Why? Because all parts that we had in the U.S. are also available over there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, we share those part numbers and we tell people who the vendors are for those parts. Some of those companies have been sold out and other people, but there's so many parts out there on these generic parts uh, that we used in the tractor that parts on our oldest tractors are still readily available. Brilliant. You know, it, it, it's fantastic because you, know, you were saying there about sales of new tractors and so on and so forth. What's happening here in Ireland is um, a lot of tractors, a lot of the majors are getting farmers into contracts, kind of lease agreements. Yeah. And they're trading up in the... And I suppose, work we've all done it. When you have money in your pocket, you're going to buy a new tractor. And what's happening is a lot of the farmers are going into maybe two, three, four, five-year lease agreements. And at the end of that, they have to buy another new tractor. How are you doing, folks? Brilliant. That was Ron Harmon there, big equipment company and big builder of the, the world's biggest tractor, the V16747. Um, big board. The tractor weighs in at just under 50 tons. And when you're driving down the, 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 the motorway or the freeway or wherever you are, um, it's 25 feet wide. So, so go out and measure your car, measure your driveway. It ain't going to fit. Um, big thanks to Ron and uh, everyone at Big Equipment Company there. Um, brilliant to put this together and help me out um, on this video. Now, this is section one of section two. Um, it's going to be two pieces. Um, I talked, I spoke to Ron for about an hour and 20 minutes. So my plan was to edit it down and put it into maybe a half an hour or 40 minutes, whatever. But look, the video was interesting. Um, he went into some fantastic detail about the big board and the big and big equipment and where he is and how he got into what he's doing. And Ron, we really appreciate I really appreciate it. And um, I'm sure anyone that's listening to it appreciates it too. Um, if you have an interest in big board or big equipment, um, get on there. Ron has some fantastic stuff. They have a fantastic website um, with some brilliant machines in it. Um, so reasonably priced, very reasonably priced stuff there, kind of priced for everyone, really. Um, the link will be in the description down below. Um, so hit that, go down there, and you'll get all the links. You'll get my own podcasts. Morgan O'Flaherty, Country Life, where I spoke to Machinery Pete, Farmer Phil, um, heap of them all over Ireland and America at this stage. And um, they're down there. Get down there and click on the links. Get in, look at the podcast. Check out some of my other videos on YouTube. And uh, that's kind of it. Thanks, everyone. Look out for part two of this video. It'll be on in about a week's time. It'll be Mark 2 of 2, uh, Ron Harmon, Big Bud. And um, yeah, that's kind of it for myself. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, look out for more. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe. And again, thanks to everyone at Big Equipment for your help. Cheers. Bye now.